Welcome to Good Game, your no BS insights for crypto founders. Where are we in the cycle? Are we still in a four-year cycle? Are we in a super cycle? Are we? You're always in, in the first inning. Left. <laughs> We're always. Are we in the <laughs> left translated cycle? <laughs> Where are we? I'd say we're about halfway through it, if I had to guess. Say it again? We're halfway through it. Yeah, halfway through it. Yeah, halfway yeah. through it. Sorry. I didn't want to hear that. <laughs> no, yeah. but maybe it's the super cycle. Maybe the ETFs just permanently keep us out. I mean, we haven't even had the halving yet. Yeah. It's also like, what does it even mean to be a four-year cycle anymore? Do I think like we'll have rampant fraud like we did last time? Most definitely not. Looking for your next startup idea in crypto? Check out our request for startups list and get inspired at alliance.xyz forward slash ideas. All right, welcome to Good Game. Today we have Zahir from Split Capital and Dan from CMS. Uh, and today we're going to talk macro, where the market is today. How should founders be uh, thinking about raising their round if they haven't raised their round yet? Thinking more about where the uh, Ethereum ETF is. We just had the CPI update. Trump or Biden, we can talk about talk a bit about politics and whether or not we're going to choose rich today. Is that um, like this? Is that the official saying? And we just like it seems done now. Is choose it already rich. over? Is choose rich? No, done? no, no, no. And it's like it's like done. Like it's side. Like that's decided to be like the. It's the it's the the, it's the year. It's the it's going to be the we're going to make it, not going to make it. It's well, the new uh, half on same staying poor of the or half yeah, on same poor. Say, right, exactly. That's what yeah, it is. So yeah, we but, just need. We need the CMS username now to reflect it, right? We need. I can't. I can't MS. change it anymore. I had to. Oh, do, oh the, no! The stupid Twitter blue thing—it's like a pain. Oh, that's for so those of you who don't. I know they buried me because I didn't have it. Like it, it like actually became unusable. Like not, not that it like really matters, but like you were just like yelling into the void if you didn't have the like little blue ticker. Yeah, and then I enjoyed those me. trends. I, I can't it. do it. I know. You need to lobby and write Elon. And I'm sure he'll read it. Really at least it gave me some idea where we are in the market. <laughs> I mean, that was like my I indicators. <laughs> <laughs> I was crowdsourcing them at the end. People would just give them to me. I, it got very easy. I got one in there. It was Boston Dynamics when the robot dogs were gone. The CMS Boston <laughs> Dynamics. That was, that was my one user submission. So, um, And I actually got I got the, the, the blue chips. So I got the CMS logo in blue. That was, that was also me. Thankfully, just just a, l- a little bit of credit I'll take for that. No, I guys, listen. I wish I could continue to change it. What about the picture, like the uh, P, uh, PFP? You can't change it. They'll they'll nuke oh, your yeah uh, yeah. yeah. They'll, they'll nuke yeah your, basically, your blue they lock you in. Yeah. You can't. It's just you can do this stuff. It's just a bitch. Like they just like make it take yeah. time and yeah. Like I could change it. It'd just be like it's too much of a hurdle. Yeah, I almost want to get paid for it at that point. Like it's just too much time. Correct. You do get paid, um, though. Yeah. Oh, true, true, true. The narratives, like right? The upside. 20 bucks. A, yeah. <laughs> I, I got $600 last month. That's a big. You got 600 Dude, yeah. that's huge. Holy crap. Wow. You're eating good, huh? <laughs> that's right. 600. Did you YOLO into it? Um, let, let's, get, let's get straight to it. Uh, what's, what's, <laughs> you guys, uh, what's your guys' uh, macro view? Where are we? Where where we are on the uh, uh, in the cycle? What about the ETF flow? You know anything else you track? I don't think much of the like traditional macro stuff. Like I, I would be honest, I'm like bearish people that trade crypto, like getting involved in that stuff in aggregate. But like even more so right now, I think it's like pretty irrelevant. I kind of think it really is just about these ETF flows um, until they slow or stop. But as long as like they're consistently like putting in, I don't know. 300 to 500 million sort of a day, I think it's a pretty easy trade um, where you just like sort of like run with that. Like, I really don't think you care about anything else that's going on in the world. Like, obviously, like absent, like a real exogenous shock, but like little sort of macro changes are kind of irrelevant in the grand scheme of things when you've got like the flows like being as big as they are still. Now they may slow, right? Like they're not going to, I mean, maybe they'll be like this for a really long time, but like it's, it's, it's not like a guarantee, but while it continues, just like ride that wave. When do you think, I mean, I, obviously it's very hard to figure out when it'll slow down, but like if you're, if you're a, a traditional fund manager looking into this, you would obviously comp it to gold. So would you comp it against gold and what, like from a market cap perspective, like how, how would you think about where investors will say like, all right, this is enough? 
I, I think it's 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 kind of irrelevant, right? Because like I think what what Bitcoin represents to people at this point is just like like everyone's a, a, a accepted that it is just like the excess valve of uh, you know monetary policy, right? Like it could be worth infinite, and it doesn't have to mean anything, right? But I think the problem becomes for a lot of people like how allocated you are overall to it, and if you are or aren't. It's like a binary bet, right? Like am I in crypto? Am I not in crypto? And if not, and this thing is running away from me, why am I not in it? Right. Um, and I think that's more of the question that's being asked than, you know, what is a reasonable price target for, for Bitcoin? Right. Um, because uh, objectively speaking, like there's no reason why it's trading at 70 K versus a hundred K plus for, you know, and that's also the interesting thing about like price discovery, like what's the fair value? Who knows? Right. Like, and, and, and where does it head to from here? Uh, Bitcoin is the pinnacle momentum asset. Right. So, we could be trading much higher. And I think Dan and I probably agree that we probably will be trading much higher within reason. Um, but how, how and why does someone get there is, is I think whatever kind of moon math they want to come up with them, themselves. Yeah, I think that there's been some like outflows from like the gold products that people have attributed to inflows into the Bitcoin. I just, I just don't think like people pair trade it that much or like even really think about it a ton. Like maybe if we start to approach it in a larger percentage, it'll start to become a narrative, but in the short term, I, I don't think it's like a ton of what people are thinking. But guys, maybe uh, maybe taking a step back. So every trader, every investor has different time horizons. For me, for example, my, I have like maybe two strategies. I have a cycle long time horizon and I have short term time, time horizon, like one to two months kind of thing. For you guys, wh what is your primary focus? At what time horizon do you feel you have an edge? That's a good question. I, I don't know, like one to three sort of month time horizon, if that makes sense. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trading super short dated stuff, um, but I think we try to see where flows are moving and then what the corollary, like wh if you push one part of the system, like what will react next? I mean, a lot right. of it is like a leg lead relationship between stuff. And I, I think that time kind of plays out on a weekly and then maybe like a monthly sort of level. Yeah. Generally what we do is we, we take like a year long approach and then we will, um, condense it back to like six months, three months, one month, one week, and we'll liquidity adjust uh, each one of those different time horizons. So we'll make one big, you know, bold claim for the year, right? It's like ETH, ETF, ETH is bullish, let's just say, or like last year it was Bitcoin, ETF, Bitcoin is bullish kind of idea. Very simple, very easy to kind of wrap around and very easy to falsify too, right? If that narrative doesn't hit, then like you can actually reduce your positioning, but everything else in between, right? Like, you know, N nobody can tell you what is the next narrative. I think that's like the biggest trap, but it's more like, okay, there's money moving in this direction and this direction seems like it has legs and it, and then we can reason out like there's generally some, some good momentum moving in that direction. So, um, that's, that's how we think about it more broadly. And then also like, you know, final point being that, yeah, you know, once you can kind of think about like the next uh, couple of months, then you will have those periods where markets will move like counter cyclically and then like, things change like very drastically. That's why we have a high pensions for liquidity too. Okay, so I agree with you guys that probably the most important metric to track right now is the ETF flow. And that almost outweighs anything else at, the, at this moment. But I would assume that there might be some things that would lead to the ETF flow itself, right? So the ETF flow is a reflection of other pieces of information, potentially. So one thing I can, I can think of is I feel like NVIDIA this one stock is actually pulling the entire market up, the entire stock market upwards, and the stock market bleeds into crypto a little bit. Um, do you feel the same? Do, do you feel there's any other le leading indicators that might be interesting? Yeah, I mean, like risk assets in general, we're going to trade like sort of in the same direction. I think like the biggest issue you have with the ETF that you like can't sort of like pull like those sort of heuristics out with yet is that like the access is a little like it's stepwise, right? Like, and we don't really, I'd say everybody in this conversation has no fucking idea. And like in general, sort of the like crypto spot market participants like that we're going to talk to, like don't have any ideas, like the access and sort of the decision allocation of putting into the ETF for like larger pools of capital is like completely out of our purview like some of this stuff is like people can't even like access the like product yet and it's like opening up and it's stepwise and like certain like advisors get access to it and then like their client base can touch it or certain like approvals and risk committees need to go through certain like larger like allocators that like may so they take so like that whole decision making process is absent to us and i think that is going to drive a lot of the fun flow for the first year of this thing and 
that's more important than like what is the s p sort of done over like sort of the year so i think like that's the problem is like yes if we're in a steady state we're like Anybody who wants to trade this thing is able to trade this thing and like get a piece of it. And whatever sort of like exogenous or shocks you're seeing like in the equity market, like move demand for that. The thing is like the demand is being driven by like access, like still, I think for a while. And I think we, the problem is we're really just like not going to really be able to get a good view into that from our world. Yeah, I, th- I think that's that's like the most important point, right? Like these flows are so sporadic. We can't even like I can't tell you what the flow will be tomorrow. The only thing is I can see it on the tape generally and then from there then we can kind of you know do some reverse engineering on the math but uh, altogether like you know can it trade another 500 million daily for the next 30 days easily can it also not like we there's i have no more certainty in one outcome than another necessarily which is makes makes it way more difficult to trade and i'm sure dan can can probably agree to that yeah i think we're really outgunned here like i think it's just like a world we don't play in so here earlier you said that uh you're bullish on eth this year and probably due to the ETH, ET, uh, the ETH ETF, what is your probability estimate for the for the ETF approval in May? Guys, I'm I'm as ETH aligned as they come, but um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you, right? Like whatever my probability is worth, it can you know has the volatility of like swinging seventy percent in either direction overnight, right? So I'm optimistic that the ETF will pass in the next year or so. Um, whether that's in May or not, I don't know, but I'd probably say like pretty good odds that that's the case. Have you heard any informed takes from other people? Let's say the Bloomer ETF guys. No, they, I mean honestly, like, and I don't mean to call these guys out because they've done like good work in other areas, but like they just don't seem to understand like what the point of Ethereum is broadly, and they kind of seem like pretty backed up on on Bitcoin as a whole. Um, I, I'm like, like no, there, I mean I tweeted this last night too. I was like, there's been no cogent argument. Like Nate, is it Nate Garassi from from uh, ETF Store? He's been he's been like probably the only like tradfi guy who's kind of like nobody's giving me a good reason why ETH won't pass outside of just like the administration hates it, which isn't a real narrative, right? That's not a real like you can't you can't just hate something and then like oh I'm not going to approve it. Like you'll get sued, and they have gotten sued, and like do they want to run it again? I don't know. All the legal experts at least are very bearish. Uh, Trevinsky. Um, Terminsky Jake Trubinsky, was very bearish. bearish. Yeah, he's Jake very Trubinsky's bearish. He's bearish everything, though. He comes out like the world <laughs> every couple months. I mean, I love him, and I like him a lot. He's like a no, good guy. He's a great guy, guy. Like, He just, like, he skews so hard negative. Yeah. Um, I mean, is it not a common thing among lawyers? Like, a lawyer? Yeah, I think lawyers are I, mean, the most, I, mean, I think, like, in general, you're dealing with, like, the not greatest display of people. So you just, like, you if you end up in a court, right? Like, something has gone wrong, and, like, somebody is, so I think they just have this very skewed, outlook of like i don't know that's my take or at least like well people that are way deep in it so so usually like your your first job in 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 whatever sector you're in will shape your outlook and jake i believe joined in like 2017 2018 in crypto like pretty much full-time um DeFi crypto, too, on top of that right like crypto policy yeah. right like when it was like yeah. hyper demonized right so he's probably just like oh like you know in the same way that like i i just view everyone as the antagonistic crypto like but that's very much a byproduct of like the environment that i kind of like got my yeah. uh you know standing in crypto so i, I would imagine there's some, some some amount of bias there by the way jake jabrinsky is a great guy he's, he's great guy tier yeah one. he's very nice i don't i i don't know if the same question applies but i i'd put it at a coin flip which is maybe a little bit better than like the i think one of the implied odds seem like 30% by like the random sort of poly market prediction markets. Yeah. I, I, like, I yeah. don't know, put stock in it. The Bloomberg UTF guys, like they have like a very high weighting in my mind on this stuff. Like they've been pretty on it for everything, but there's a couple of smart people that are making arguments on the other side. I like, I got nothing. So I'm just going with a coin, but I do think we'll have it before year end. I just don't know if we'll have it may like the timing's a little like, I, I'd be very shocked if we're, here this time next year talking and there's not it, it, there's not a lot of reason i think to hold it up that long um yeah. but may i don't know may sure i could see it getting kicked i don't know so i'm not yeah i I'm probably not agree with that trading it if that makes sense like i don't think there's Risky. a ton of that dad um, just naturally aligned with ETH. so <laughs> i i look i think i think we need more I mean, like a, you want to put you put an etf wrapper on everything if you can get it through I will say I don't think we're going to see ETF products and anything else further down the curve for a long time. Yeah. I think that flow is going to pretty much be get a CME future, get that trading for a bit, then roll in an ETF. I know, like, there's people who keep talking about, oh, we're going to have this ETF. And like, I anything further out, I do not see a world they're putting that through yeah. any time. 
even if ETF Wait, gets approved. Like for the, ETH, the, I just what, one of the Bloomberg ETF guys said the TradFi world doesn't care about ETH. Uh, something to that I, effect. Do you agree? I or think no? that's probably uh, doesn't care versus like has less demand than Bitcoin. Like it definitely has less demand than Bitcoin. I mean, it's like a smaller asset. Um, I think that they're probably not getting ton of inbound interest for ETH from the people they're speaking to. And I think that probably does meet the demand. I think the bigger problem is, though, they're missing retail interest in it. And there's also interest in it once it exists, right? Like if you've got Bitcoin there, those people who are taking positions in it are like at least naturally going to like look at ETH. So I don't know. I think it's a little skeptical to be like, oh, they're only interested in Bitcoin. They won't take a look at ETH. It's this whole like gateway drug concept with like crypto is like sort of always been a thing. I don't know. I don't know. I think people, if you put it out there, it'll get inflows and it'll trade. I, I, I think there's more demand for it than just because people aren't coming up to you being like, I really want to like get some ETH. Like, I, I don't know. What would be the narrative that would get them going on ETH? I think staking, honestly, is like a pretty, pretty lucrative one, right? Like imagine getting dividends on, on ETH, right? What um, the internet bond was what I, what I heard? I mean, it's, it's, it's easy, right? Attractive. Like, yeah, it's super attractive. Well, also like. Um, this is also part of the reason why ETH doesn't hold up well as an index asset because like it's so usable, right? Like you can collect yield, you can do a lot of things with ETH that you theoretically can't do with BTC today. So I think that narrative is changing what, though. That narrative is changing. No, it is changing for sure. For sure it's changing. But I'm just saying like, like generally speaking, like you see like the largest holders of ETH have been the same holders and they'll go park it from like, you know, like we'll put it in, in Lido and now it's an Eigen and you know, whatever else, right? Like Mantle or, or, or. Morpheus or whatever, you know, other kind of staking platform they, 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 they so choose. But I think the yield narrative is pretty attractive for, for ETH, right? Because it's deflationary and you get yield, like, pretty sick. I think it's just easy enough to be like it's a diversity thing. Like, you buy a little bit of this, you buy a little, like, I don't know, you size it, you buy 80, 20 Bitcoin ETH. Like, I don't know. We, we would see this historically back in the day, like, circle. Like, guys would come in, they'd buy, like, a slug of Bitcoin, they'd buy a little bit of ETH, and then they'd, like, spray out. Like, it was almost never, like, I just want to buy like one like it's like i take like a little bit of a basket approach diversification uh, i don't know if you saw jim bianco's tweet from bianco research i want to throw this out there just to get your thoughts um he talked about you know how you know, i think he said this at the bottom by the way this is around like 60k or whatever um and he said that uh you know because it settles in cash we could have a polarized effect of up only and then down only or like we'll have a liquidation cask a cascade of liquidations because ultimately when you're selling back in uh, via etf it'll settle in cash it'll automatically impact the market what are your thoughts on that thesis or theory that that jim bianco put out there i don't understand so he's saying but wait what i mean like if you're selling it's going down i get that but like his thought yeah that's 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 all he's saying yeah is he saying it's worse because it's a cash create redeem mechanism yes yes i i don't think that really matters too much i i mean i think like what matters more is like if, if the people that have like purchased the ETF, I don't know, what has been like 10 billion of flows, right? Like if those like people are more or less sort of likely to dispose of the position, if it like starts moving against them, I, and I would actually say it's like a group of people that probably less, like, I think like that money is a lot stickier than you sort of see with the traditional pools of capital that were purchasing crypto. Like crypto is still is like very retail heavy, right? So like that tends to be a very shaky user base. I think the ETF, probably skews less though i haven't seen a good breakdown of that flow at all i don't even know if you can get a good breakdown of it like if it's all just like people buying in their brokerage account instead of like going on coinbase like it's just the same group of people anyway and it won't matter but i don't know i don't think the cash create redemption mechanism like will add volatility on the way down i'm not a buyer of that yeah it's 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 just naturally bearish right if people start redeeming um what's just something he did say right like you know because it goes up so so hot then it might come off so hot but yeah, I gen- I generally think like the average buyer of the ETF is not like like Dan said, some random like retail buyer who's uh, pumped in ETFs. Number one, like you can't even get options on them. Number two, it's like why would you wait all this time to just start suddenly pounding in? You could have just done it on Coinbase all these years. So I think yep. the only rational narrative is probably like uh, the people underestimate drastically how large the RIA market in the U.S. is and how many people are just considered high net worth individuals and how many of these people can just like. You know, the, the, the aggregate like number of dollars that exists in the U.S. just from like private wealth is an insane amount of money. And we're not even like close to having like any material flow uh, into crypto from from these people. And it's already had such a drastic you know price impact, right? What are you guys uh, trading these days? Meme coins, basis trading, anything else? 
AI coins. Should have been trading meme coins. That's it's been all the action. Um, I so we've been we trade we trade a lot of the L ones. So that's like kind of still been our dominant. Like it's it's liquid. It's big. You can like like, like that's kind of like been our bread and butter. Um, we do do a fair bit of the basis. The basis has been hard just because the cash like flow. Well, and I say cash, like the the ETF flows are so big that they you, you tend to like to have this like heuristic where. And the curve gets really steep, right? Like that's like gravity, like comes like sort of back. The problem is if like the cash bit is so big and it just keeps like ripping it up, like that's, you're, there's a lot of leverage in the system right now, but it's not as relevant because there's also a lot of like cash pushing through the system. Like it's, it's hard to then like use sort of that natural like function. I mean, that being said, like it's, it's not going to last forever and the curve will like come meet it and you'll still get like that roll down, but you've had like better luck just like being allocated like long. So we're doing a lot of the rotation of like the L1s. Um, that has caught a pretty good bit the last like sort of week as like Solana slowed sort of its growth. Um, but we've also just been looking a lot at the new stuff that's getting built on Bitcoin. We've been taking a deep dive into that stuff. That's um, There's a lot going on there fast and we're just trying to like get up to speed to it. So that's like sort of where we've been like playing around. Yeah, very much the same. But I would say m- more of our focus has kind of been on like the hottest of narrative, right? Which is like, AI has, has taken off. Like that's been a decent sized position for us. What AI sec- or I guess startups or companies or tokens you're looking at? Oh, I get to show my bags. I'm okay. uh, <laughs> well, This is not uh, investment advice. <laughs> not investment advice. Um, no, I, I, being more serious. Um, you know, I, I think that the simpler the narrative, the, the easier it is for people to understand. I think the biggest mistake you can make in any of this stuff is just acting like you understand what the potential technolo- technological implications are. I'll be the first to say I don't and to understand that like this is equally in the same eyes of like L1 valuation. What's the value? Well, whatever the comp of the other value is, right? Like, you know, so that, that's how everything in crypto trades. It's how everything in the world trades. So Render, Tau, you know, these are obviously the two biggest names um, that people are really looking at. There's been a lot of like seed deals, pre-seed deals, Series A deals that are doing like AI, whatever, Billion like dollar valuations. It's insane. Right. It's insane. Yeah. Um, we're back. That we're, we're, uh, back. That we're, we're so back. I mean, this is another problem we can talk about too. It's just like venture dollars in crypto. Like this has been like the scourge of the space. Sorry, Dan. Um, that just like all of these dollars coming into like these deals. Like you, you can, you, like I've coined this term, like the, the, the crypto VC supernova. We're writing research on this, but um, you're seeing like kind of this almost implosion of like, how much money is going into into deals and how quickly, right? Like you have like incremental dollars kind of coming into the space and then like 10x the VC demand all of a sudden, like it's crazy. But I think, you know, overall, like in the other things that we kind of you know, take, a, take a look at really is just like ETH related products. I think Eigen will be very, very large. Blast 2 has been pretty interesting. We're seeing a lot of these tokens kind of like... Are you farming either of those? Um, we've definitely taken a look at Eigen. We've been spending time there and then, you know, on, uh, and Eigen related pro- pro- products like mental, um, you know, Morpheus, that kind of stuff. But I think Eigen will be like one of the more, more sticky narratives for ETH. Um, and it can create a pretty reflexive ETH bid too. Um, that's also why we're pretty, you know, pretty much very interested in ETH in particular, but a lot of it really just comes down into like how much exposure can you get in the market broadly, right? Like a lot of this stuff trades pretty cyclically anyway like ai came back after meme coins went down kind of thing right like um so you can see all these like market rotations happen within themselves which don't make sense historically right in the past it used to be index you know mid caps and then like garbage right but now it's kind of like we'll we'll cycle through different bags of garbage before you know i don't know eventually (laughs) like like imploding but so uh, uh, i have a question on a on render versus tau um, so my thesis is oh, that no. AI coins are the meme coins uh, of the cycle. But then the question is, I have in mind is, let's say a, a re- new retail comes to this market. How do they pick which AI coin to buy? Because there, there's actually a, a very meaningful differences between Tau and Render. Tau is, has a much worse unit bias uh, than, than <laughs> Render. And, and it's not listed on a centralized exchange. Yeah, I mean, and you just answered your own question. Big. but those are those are two i mean you, you can't access it that's huge and then like the unit by yeah. the unit is very real yeah yeah um also it's just like in the name right like i think that's like a very un- underappreciated aspect of this ultimately i don't um yeah it's like bit tensor tau like i don't i don't understand ai from that right 
render AI, I feel like it's kind of hard to like mess that up, right? So, but they've both done like tremendously well, right? So it's just more of a function of like how much liquidity can you get on the asset, right? Like that's what I care about more. It's like, okay, you want to buy some AI index, whatever, right? But like ultimately, like the only differentiating factor is just how much can I, you know, pair off against like some other asset in the, in the portfolio. What about that, that coin that's listed on Binance with the ticker AI? Sleepless AI or something like that? <laughs> there, there, there's great, literally a, a great ticker. But <laughs> they have no product. I mean, like maybe they do have a product, something with games or something from what I read when I went on the website. No, no, it's not XAI. You were talking about XAI, Imran. No, Sleepless AI. What is Sleepless AI? I mean, I was gonna look this up the that's the time. AI yeah, ticker. Man, on right. I mean, from the website, I, I feel like it was it's just... Yeah, that's the one on Binance. Yeah, Sleepless is on Binance. Yeah. I, which I don't is know anything the, about this. Yeah, which is the OG AI ticker. It's worth like two, uh, $1.2 billion. <laughs> I guess that's what an AI ticker on Binance is worth. Right. But the ironic part is because, you know, American retail can't access Binance anymore. It might not be that bullish, right? So we yeah, care about the base Binance is more. You know what I found out recently? People say China bans Bitcoin or China bans crypto. In actuality, Chinese citizens can uh, open an account on Binance and American citizens cannot. Yeah, no, no part of that is surprising, I guess, I suppose. Well, they never, they never really banned it, right? It was just like certain people couldn't move cash in and out. Like there was restrictions, but like you've always been able to hold it natively. Right. Yeah. I, don't know, I mean, they've been, been dealing with this since 2013. Yeah. Well, I mean, because Binance they, runs a giant P2P OTC yeah. market still. At least I think so. I, not that I deal with it a ton, but like, at least that's how people were getting in. Yeah. Also, like, Binance is way deeper on, on uh, sorry, China's way deeper on, on the Bitcoin narrative overall. Most of the BRC stuff that's been happening has been oh, uh, yeah. Chinese. Oh, yeah. 100%. I'd say they're a good six months ahead of anybody. Like, it, like there was multiple assets that were, like, over a billion dollars, like, trading, yeah. like, big size in that sector that you'd be, you, I swear to God, you would have taken 10 people in the West that were like actively trading crypto and maybe like one of them and heard of either. It was like wild. This was like probably six months ago. So Ordy? It, yeah, like Ordy was the big one. What was like the other? Um, uh, track was another one. Track. Um, track. I guess like stacks track protocol. that I heard of, but anyway, yeah, but like there was a, there was a whole just like movement over there and we were just like complete. It, it is like a little wild to me, like how, different the west and the east are still not so much with like bitcoin but like the further like tail assets like there's like really two different worlds still going on and we try to keep a good line with people that are over there it's like it's hard but um it's like pretty beneficial to know like how they're thinking and they have no idea what we're like looking at half the time yeah it's it's ironic right like we um one of the core theses we had around stacks internally was literally we love stacks because nobody in the u.s like really is paying attention to it um <laughs> and it just like does well in that narrative and because like american vcs are so caught up in solana versus eth um like <laughs> american no, you know more like modularity <laughs> so whatever 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 nonsense you want to come up with right whatever buzzword you want to you want to insert but but instead like people really overlooked how much flow like these like i remember already was doing like top five volume like for yep. a few weeks straight like on yep. binance which is just nuts like and like not one person i knew like held this thing other than like my friends at UTXO, that's about it, right? Like, So so speaking of uh, Bitcoin and modularity and all that stuff, uh, Danny mentioned your your biggest trade is on the layer one rotation. What what are you excited about? What are you bullish on these days? Both from a short-term and long-term perspective. God, I guess like, so on the short-term perspective, I think you've got a lot of money that moved into Bitcoin, ETH, and Solana over the last, I don't know, year, right? Let's call it. Um, I think a lot of that money, if it does look to sort of just like if it looks to diversify in any like capacity or if it looks like to like sort of move into any other bets, like I think there's other L1s. I don't want to like name names because they just don't want to get in, like involved, like sort of like picking sides or anything. But like there's a bunch of the other L1s that are sort of of the same vintage that even if your argument is like they're not going to sort of hold the candle, they're going to be like a competitor. They're probably tra- trading too cheap on a relative basis. But I think there'll be like capital flow sort of into that as a pair trade. Um, I would never like out, like advocate going short like the majors sort of against those, but I do think that like, there'll be some more rotation of stuff into that. Um, He's whole, talking about AVAX, by the way. Yeah, I know. I'm not talking about <laughs> AVAX. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a bunch. Um, oh, I'd say there's five that like, we've like taken shots on. Um, but 
there's also the whole L2 world for Bitcoin, like, isn't a thing yet. But when it is, I do think there'll be like the same sort of like pair thing where like people will like look to those as like an allocation decision versus taking sort of money out of their like Bitcoin ETH and so on positions that have done well. Um, we're also like, we're pretty excited, like Monad, like we think that's going to be like a big one as it comes like down the pipe. That's like a longer term one. Like Kevin works there. He was like, it was our intern for a bit. So it's like, it's got a soft spot in my heart. Um, but really like sort of what they're doing over there. But that's, you can't action on that. So I can name it. Um, I don't know. That's like sort of how we, we think of stuff. Like, I, I, our decisions are less technical and more just market flow than they, to be like completely out. Like we're not really making strong technical, like fundamental levels decisions on like where we think like pricing is going like we're not like this is better because of xyz whatever like technical implementations it's more just like we think this is cheap on a relative basis we think flows will sort of go there to continue yeah generally we look at it pretty similarly the only big thing that we kind of like really like differentiate on i guess is just like we just like holding the index more like if we're just optimistic eth like anything that anything that isn't eth that we want to hold like if we're bullish eth uh, has to really outperform in our minds. Um, it has to be for a specific reason. So Solana was our like biggest kind of like conviction bet from like 10 bucks because it's just free money, you know? And then that obviously switches at a certain point when it's like, okay, everyone's like way over allocated Solana. Now it's, you know, kind of goes back to ETH and like that rotation alone, like can, can make a fund. And then, you know, more so on the, uh, like L2s on, on, on ETH too. I think we're going to start seeing like a lot of those kind of taper off in value a bit because of just how like expensive they are on a relative basis to like a lot of, uh, all tell ones, like Arbitrum being worth like 20 something billion is, is quite expensive. So, um, the L2s trade is so rich in my mind. Yeah. They're insane. They're, they're just, it's, it's absurd. Those are ones that like we, we, we're not as fond of anymore. But it'll change, right? It all ebbs and flows. And, like, this is why we don't give, like, we don't call pod shots, like, uh, you know, across the board. Like, AVAX has done tremendously well in the last, like, week or two. It's, like, Maple Story narrative. But, um, you know, and, and you're seeing, like, a pretty pretty fat bit on that. But for newer technologies, like, you know, obviously, like, uh, Monad has been, like, the, the biggest one that everyone's kind of talked about. But Inisha as well, um, another, you know, modularity kind of narrative um, that I think will do quite well. Team is good. Obviously, like I'm biased. I have, I have a, I have an angel investor, but at the same time, like generally, it's these teams that I think will, 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 will that have a differentiated product, but will, will be able to deliver. Also, it just really is 100 percent driven by market value, right? Like, what's to say this stuff should trade at 10, 20, 30 billion dollars when it when it goes live, right? I'd never thought say would trade at 10 billion like it does, but you know, congrats to the team for for making it happen, right? Is there um? organic activity happening on uh, Avalanche? I haven't been really following it closely. I know there's a meme coin called... Uh, they got a meme say it, fund. Say it, say it. <laughs> say, it. Gonna... say it, say it. Cock. <laughs> Cock you knew. Cock you knew. I am, like, definitely not just talking about AVAX either. Like, there's there's definitely <laughs> multiple ones that are... I don't know why everybody's, like, inferring that, but I'm gonna... It, it, it oh, depends. Yeah, yeah. If it goes up, I'll take credit for it. No, um, I, I, I think there's like a handful that like matter. The thing with the activity is like the the TV on the activity, like a lot of times price drives it too. Um, yeah, like I think that's like part of the problem. Yeah, the fundamentals get better when the price goes up, kind of thing. I mean, but it's really real, right? Like people want to start using things when the price goes up, or they have an incentive to go do things, right? And this is like I don't know. We, we probably can talk about the points thing, right? But like that's probably like the best abstraction of this concept, right? Where like people are like, how do we pre influence the pre TGE of the pre product pre whatever, right? Like it's like the announcement of an announcement, right? It's like Justin Sun like cubed, you know, like how do we, how do we financialize this market? Right. So, um, I mean, we're seeing it. I mean, crypto, crypto is the best market in the world for, for creating levers of financial speculation. So uh, I'm all, I'm, I'm here for it. So. When Athena first launched, there's a a lot of like criticism. What side of the coin are you are you for uh, Athena? I, obviously, like I think they hit a billion dollars or something, TBL. But I'm curious on would you have invested if they pitched you? Pros cons. What are your thoughts? Maybe Dan with you first. Yeah, I I think look Athena like at its core is like it's a trade that's like packaged up and like so which I like don't have a problem with. I think like my issue, if any, with it is that people don't like realize that it has risk. I think like that is my like concern with it is like, like I think it sometimes it gets like confused to be like whatever they call it, like a dollar peg 
like what it's like it's close enough that like people sort of get to this like stable coin idea on it which i think is is bad but packaging up like the basis like roll down and like selling that and like throwing on some like staking yield with it is like clearly there's demand for it and like people want that yield and like that's like a thing and that's fine like i don't have like a core problem with it i just like do want sort of the market to be aware there is risk like this thing could get toasted like it's not like guarantee and like i'm not saying like it's unlikely that we're going to just like suddenly start trading like crazy like backwardated but like there's been times where like the curve is like moved down like 35 50 percent like in the course of like 48 hours like it can get have like real shocks to it and like you think you can like execute on these things and you can't so i i don't know as somebody who's like traded a lot of it like just want to make sure that people are aware of sort of the risk on it but like there's i got no beef with like it as like a concept like i think like it's fine as long as people are aware of that yeah i think you know it's ironic that uh, you know you guys brought us on i was like i'd probably say like um, I know Dan's traded the futures curve probably more than anyone else I know in the space. Um, but, you know, I've spent a tremendous amount of time on it as well. It's definitely not a free ride in any way, shape or form. It's also like I got into like a bit of a spat the other day with someone talking about like uh, unifying rates on on uh, like across the board. It's like you should never want to re- unify rates like counterparty risk, credit risk between different exchanges. It's massive, right? Like what happens when one exchange blows out or like you can't put enough size on another, right? Um, and then there's like a lot of things that I think like, again, it, it's just depends on how you, how you kind of want to advertise it. Again, I have friends who've invested in this friends working on the project, so I'm not trying to knock it, but like at the same time, like there's definitely like inherent risks and also like counterparty risks on, on exchanges that you actually want to, you know, go and, and, and put this money on, right? Like, I mean, this is a good question, right? Like, and you can ask Dan on this, but how much money do you think the futures curve can even take, right? Um, at like a decent yield. It's not as large as people think, right? So there's even a cap to it. Like you, you, you are bringing your own kind of cap into how much rates can go, right? So, like the product works really well when it's not that large, theoretically. Or you got a bull market. But even then, like I don't know, the rates will come off enough, or like then you'll have like really weird arbs between CME and like it's like a bunch of things, right? Like um, they call like, it uh, they call it the synthetic dollar, and the ticker is USDE, which to me that for me that's the biggest problem with it. Which is that it's pretty misleading for re- retail. Yeah, I yeah, think like, like, if, if I got any gripe with it, it's just like just call it more than like, just like this package trade that like you're looking to sell, and like that's fine, and then just like put the risks on it and let it go. I don't know. Like, yeah, this is I like, this is OG like Babel Finance. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. We, I mean, we did talk to them a lot too, and they were like setting it up, and like we, I don't think there's like any bad intentions or any like hiding of stuff. I just like I just want to make sure everybody's aware of the risks and the stuff going into it. I mean, that being said, like it's crypto, right? Like there's, there's a lot of risks and a lot of things that like nobody's like seeing when they're doing it. So it's like, this is not even probably top 10 sort of real risks I've seen, like not put in front of people. I mean, we had many such cases two years ago. <laughs> many <laughs> such cases. So will, do you think this will be around two, this product will be around two years from now? Um, I think, yeah, I do probably. Yeah. My concern for it is like that there is like a, just a giant shock. Like you guys remember XIV? You remember that like sort of like whole side yeah, first and, like, ETF, right? Yeah, yeah. and it, it's it's great, it's great, it's great, it's dead. I don't think it's going to end like that, but I just like there is like tail risk on it. Yeah, yeah. Also, it's really hard to kill these stablecoin projects for what it's worth. Like even like the worst, like I don't know, TUST or whatever, you know, random stablecoin. Like they never actually fully die because. Someone can always park, you know, USD in there and it looks good. So I guess the better question is like, will it be, you know, will, will it massively grow in two years time? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and it's very much, it's very much market beta, right? And I think Sue actually said this, right? Which is like, you're actually better off just like longing ETH if you're bullish on, on Athena, which is ironic, but yeah, the truth, right? It only yep. goes up if ETH if goes up. Where are we in the cycle? Are we still... Are we still in a four-year cycle? Are we in a super cycle? Are we You're always in, in the first inning? Left. <laughs> we're always. Are we in the <laughs> left translated cycle? <laughs> Where are we? I'd say we're about halfway through it. If I had to guess. Yeah. Say it again. Wait, I didn't hear that. We're halfway through. Halfway through. Yeah, halfway yeah. through. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I didn't want I to hear that. <laughs> no, yeah. but maybe it's a super cycle. Maybe the ETFs just permanently keep us up. Uh, I mean, we haven't even had the halving yet. Yeah. It's also like, what does it even mean to be a four-year cycle anymore? Do I think like we'll have rampant fraud like we did last time? Most, most definitely not. Like, I don't think peak to trough will be ever, like as bad as it has been in the past. But at the same time, do I think like you know 
uh, a lot of the, 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 the quote unquote VC supernova can, can persist probably not as well. Like, but it's, it's also, again, it's funny. It's like, you ask like two guys who are, who primarily run their businesses as liquid. So it's literally embedded in, in the outlook we have every day, which is, you know, I don't really know, but I don't really have to know necessarily in order to continue doing my job. And that's literally why we started split capital as a liquid fund. If we didn't do it, then it would be a huge problem because I don't know how much harder markets can run from here. And I hope it's forever, right? So, What is the biggest uh, bullshit you guys are seeing in the market or in the industry that you want to call out? Oh, they want to call out. Ooh, that's like a slightly different question. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of things being attached to meme coins, like in their market action that I think is just kind of nonsense. Um, like, and I'll say this, like, first off, like, I have no beef with them as, like, an asset. I have no pe- beef with people trading them. Like, I think the whole thing's fine. But there's this whole idea that, like, this is, like, culture incarnate. And, like, this is, like, the great... Yeah, you know, there's, like, nonsense. people... There, there's, like... And there's, like, people writing crazy theses about some of this stuff. I just, like, I'm not there. Like, maybe I'm old and, like, I just don't get it anymore, which is possible. But I, I have, personally, like, I don't see it as much more than, like, people like to speculate and they're going to yeah. find the fastest thing to speculate on and they're going to do it. Um, and that's fine. And I think that's like, cool. Like Doge isn't like a new thing, right? Like it's been around forever. It's had like multiple cycles and it doesn't mean like all these things are going to die either. People are like inferring crazy things. Like people are inferring that like, like the entire financial system is going to be overthrown because like meme coins have like changed <laughs> the way like people like think about it. I, I just like, it's a little, some of it's a little out there for me. But it's the VCs coming in now, right? So Yeah. Yeah, I, I I don't know. I like I've seen meme coins raising round now. I think like that's like wild. Like I don't, I don't, <laughs> I'm not even. I whatever. I guess like do it, disclose it. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean the meme coin stuff has definitely like moved pretty far out there. I guess in like calling things out, I would say it's just like so, something I've been telling a lot of people and just been talking about pretty actively is just how real returns are and like what what it actually means to return capital and like make money in the space. And I think there's a lot of like glorification of like a handful of people that can make money, but ultimately like doing this stuff day in, day out is extremely difficult. And like, I would not tell the average person to ever do this as their primary function. Most definitely because like, it's, there's nothing to glorify about this. Like it's, in, it's incredibly difficult and like getting to a point where you can consistently do it is, is impossibly difficult. And it's, it's, it can all go away in a minute too, right? Like you can, you can always can like end up with a reality where like your edge no longer works and you can lose your money and you don't realize it. So um, I just, you know, kind of call out like more of the P&L flexing. Today we have uh, Jackson, the founder of Thunder Terminal to talk to us a bit about what he's learned building uh, a crypto startup. Jackson, what are you building? Right now, we're trying to build a trading platform on chain that lends the same user experience as you might have with like Coinbase or Binance or any of the sort. What's one thing that you've learned while you were building this product? One of the main takeaways I had was that crypto index is way too hard on the tech. And that's fine to do. But the issue is that all of DeFi in aggregate has less users than some note taking apps on the App Store. So until there's user adoption, what's the tech good for? I don't know. That's one of the main takeaways, most definitely. How do you think about sourcing feedback from customers and users, especially being that it's much harder to reach them versus traditional Web2? We have a communities on like Telegram and Discord, and I usually get DMs on Twitter or those respective apps as well. I think like, you know, the community is pretty vocal about stuff they want. But to be frank, a lot of our developers and myself included also use the application and are traders by trade. So we don't need to source too much user feedback to know sort of what the next thing is to build. So you dog food your own product? Yeah, pretty much. What's one lesson that you've learned that you want to give to future founders that are building the space? Try to build a business as opposed to just like a token launchpad. I think incentives are kind of misaligned in crypto where founders effectively are able to IPO at any point in time, whatever they want, like an IPO equivalent. And that's fine, but you should build something sustainable. I think that's like... One of the things I very rarely see in crypto is something that lasts more than a single cycle. It's very rare. Obviously, crypto is a very volatile market. Some days you have really good days. Some days you have really bad days. Given that you're building an on-chain trading terminal, how do you take this? I'll be frank. 
a lot of people come to me and they're like, oh, you know, X tangentially competitive product has like Y feature or does, you know, this amount in volume or whatever it is. But the truth is like, I've been talking to some of the folks that we've been working with recently and I realized that we just are really the only project reinvesting back into itself and not taking money off the table. I have like the utmost respect for lifestyle businesses, but they aren't necessarily sustainable in the you know, like highest growth stages. They work to a point. So I would say that like, you know, back to the thing I mentioned regarding sustainability and making it through multiple cycles, I realized that in a bull run, you know, being cash flow positive isn't very useful. So we're pretty much going balls to the wall in this just to ensure that we do last multiple cycles as like a cemented project that people go to and are familiarized with and trust. I think like right now is the time to scale up. It's not the time to take cash off the table and not a single project that's competitive with us is doing that. None that I'm aware of. You're going all in. I think that is probably the right move coming to a bull market. Yeah, pretty much all in, all ships on the table. We'll see what the river cards are. I don't know yet, but yeah, we're going balls to the wall on this. Awesome. Jackson, thank you so much for your time. For sure. Appreciate it. What would you recommend the, the either the average retail or a crypto founder who, who has a full-time job? Just buy shit that you believe in, but that's about it. Like, And if you don't, like... Just, but the just, most just, shit that... Most shit that people believe in are actually shit. And there, there may be only a handful of, of assets that, that's worth holding long, long term. Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I think I, I push back against that. I think most people know what's value and what's not and what's real. I think every time someone's like, I'm going to go buy X and Y and Z coin, they only do it out of greed. I don't think it's, I don't think it's almost ever done out of, you know, anything other than, Hey, yo, like I need to make more money because my friend made too much money and like, you know, everyone is making money and I'm sidelined and poor. And I think literally every single person on the timeline thinks this, whether subconsciously or not, they just think like, I'm being sidelined, everyone else is making infinite more than I am, which is literally not the truth at all. Like, I think one thing that I've learned post FTX, I worked on a lot of claim stuff. Post FTX, what I learned is literally everyone lost all their money, like more or less in the space. So, um, you know, there's a pretty, pretty big like liquidation overall. Like people don't have the money that they used to have theoretically. And like, it's just best not to ever compare it to like whatever PNL flexing you see on Twitter. It's just not, it's not sticky. We've seen it a hundred times over guys like me, you like Imran Dan, we've seen like many, many PNL flexors, like lose it all uh, in the dumbest ways possible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. My, I don't know what's going on my camera. Yeah, like I, I, if anybody ever asked me, I just this has actually changed a little bit over time. But it's like I tell them to buy a little bit of Bitcoin, a little bit of ETH, and a little bit of Solana, and then just like don't look at it. Like I think that's just kind of the only advice I'll ever feel giving to. And like that used to be just Bitcoin, and then it used to just be Bitcoin ETH, and now it's like the three. Um, and if something gets really big and say like stable, I would like pitch that as like a fourth. Um, but that's like sort and like size those obviously like accordingly. I think that's like the best advice you can do. Like, if, if you're not going to be out there in the weeds, like doing this like full time, like I don't think you should be bothering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a this is another lesson from Sue, which was there. There are no part time doctors. There are no part time lawyers. There should be no part time trader, right? Given where the venture market is, I think uh, Meltem said tweeted this out yesterday. But uh, what she said was ultimately that VCs are seeing how much valuation has gone up last cycle and they're bidding up the valuations for the first six months so that they can, you know, stop allocating after the first six months of the quote unquote bull market. And it turns out it's becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy where now valuations are already where where it is at, like in the last half of the, the bull market. So how do you guys kind of see the venture market today? There's just so much more money. Yeah. There's just like a tremendous amount of money. Um, And also like a lot of these deals, like, one fund will take the whole thing down. People are just getting crowded out left and right, right now and especially. So like you may see like a $30 million raise and it's got 25 people on it, but like two guys took 29 of the 30. So it's, I don't know, like people are scrambling, I think, to like deploy. It's like, it's gotten very hard to get into rounds, which is like pushing pricing up. Some of these things are priced too cheap. Like obviously, like if you've got that much like demand on it. I don't know if like people are, I don't know if there's like a whole like really long, thought process of it other than just like i need to deploy and i can't get access and like i gotta put it somewhere i don't know that's like sort of where my thought is on the whole thing there's there's just a lot of money there's a lot of venture dollars out there like at any given point that can deploy i mean you know on that on that point like that's literally our fun thesis overall right that there's too many venture dollars in the space 
Um, and obviously most of these people aren't competitive and obviously most of these people aren't getting tier one deals. Like like I'll get angel allocation into something. Right. And I just know, like I couldn't get size on it. Like it's the same kind of group of people that will always get the same size. So it's just, it's like way more competitive and brilliance is like, it's, it's logarithmic, right? Like you're not getting like infinite brilliance all the time for some new projects and new protocol. It's like groundbreaking, right? You're getting a lot of like C plus tier projects that are getting insane valuations. It goes back to the same thesis, right? Like there are way too many crypto venture dollars pushing way too many, too few deals. I think it has nothing to do with like people allocating their only job as, as venture people is to allocate capital and to raise the next fund. We'll see what happens with the 21 vintage, but I think it's going to be pretty bad overall. So we'll see if there's like a reshuffling. Ultimately, this is why we launched a liquid fund as well. So, you know, we, we, we have that, like, it's, it's literally a trade embedded in the fund, right? That like we think ventures is going to, is going to, is not going to do nearly as well as, as liquid will, you know, risk adjusted going forward. Rob Haddock from, from Dragonfly put out a pretty good, you know, tweet thread on this. Um, but he, he really just highlights all of the kind of issues that have exist both globally and locally in crypto for, for venture overall. I think it's just like, you're getting like the last rounds of the last round to just keep pushing out more dollars. Like valuations go from, you know, a hundred to, you know, like 3 billion within, you know, eight, nine months. And I think the, the last kind of part of the whole problem is also liquidity on these things is like now getting even better, which is like really weird. So it creates like way more misaligned incentives of like projects launching at 10 billion that don't have anything on them. But like at the same time, when those tokens become liquid on market, like you'll see some pretty nasty flushes, right? This is also why altcoin open interest is so high. Relative to last cycles, we are way, 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 way beyond what we should be in terms of like altcoin open interest for perpetuals because people are like now speculating on all these tokens that basically have, you know, one in 10, right? One, like, uh, Sorry, 10 and 100, right? Like 10% of, you know, FDB is, is circulating. So now you're, you're getting like a really, really, you know, skewed circulating to FDB ratio, um, which just causes people to short and speculate and all this garbage. But ultimately, it just creates like a lot of systemic risk that eventually will come to roost, but we're probably not there yet. I mean, like venture is great, right? Like you put it in and you pray and you don't have mark to market for the most part. It's kind of a great like thing to be running in crypto and get like long-term exposure. Um, it's just like, like I said though, but it's been like, there's just a lot of money like continuing to do it. Don't let him psyops you into raising a venture fund, kids. Please don't. I don't think you should raise any fund. Mm-hmm. Correct. That's always been, I've always told people that for my life. Correct. But more seriously, you're not going to get the deals that Dan was getting. Uh, so <laughs> please do not. I don't get the deals. Like you, I'm not like in the, I'm not in the like right information flow. You're not getting the deals that Imran's getting. That's for sure. So. I actually think that's going to get a lot worse for what it's worth. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's pretty bad. Uh, billion dollar valuations, but uh, for at least for AI and Bitcoin infrastructure projects. And, 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 I and guess modular. modular. And modular. Which is like the three hottest sectors. Yeah. The, the three horsemen. <laughs> when are we launching our new project, guys? I feel like we can do KOL. We'll be the KOL for ourselves. Ordinals. <laughs> are you guys trading ordinals? Or buying uh, ordinals? Only we ordinals. have. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, but I wouldn't say it's like a ton. We like in like, it, no, it, I would not say it's like a core thing we done, but like we have like here and there. Any favorite projects that you like that if you want to name them? Oh, uh, I'd have to get the guy who like handles it. I'm like pretty out of the weeds on it. Okay. How about you, Zier? <laughs> um, are you talking about like on ordinals in particular or anything in general? Sure. Yeah, I mean, general, like any, maybe ordinals, NFT, like anything that you're seeing that, that you're excited about. Uh, Obviously, like if you look at ETH NFTs, they're down only. Yeah, I'm I'm a cursed um, NFT trader, so I will simply not touch NFTs. I will buy the index. I will be the index buyer of of NFTs and Blur and Ordi and whatever else. But um, yeah, I think you know overall, there's been a few projects that that are like more adjacent to like core L ones. Like Butterfly has been really interesting um, that we've been paying attention to, and then also Thala as well on Aptos has been really Thala, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, those two, I think are just like, just great teams. And, and, and like, like, again, like that's kind of what we focus on internally. So we just focus on teams that like people overlook or don't have a mandate for, and, and we focus and see if we can, you know, help them out and, and, and push them to a spot where like, they're like literally making money, which might be bearish actually, but, um, they're literally making money and like doing really well and, and things are growing in the right direction. But I think once the zeitgeist catches up, then different ballgame. All right. This was, a. Uh... 
good chat. Any any final comments, thoughts uh, on the market? Uh, maybe I guess uh, Dan, you you've tweeted this before uh, about the speculative ball of fire. Um, hot ball of money. Hot ball of fire. Hot ball of money. There you go. Oh speculative my God. ball of fire. Oh my oh, God. It's literally never been more over for this podcast. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it's over. Hot ball of fire. Hot ball of fire. Uh, hot, if, ball if of we're in, hot ball of money. <laughs> oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> We're gonna cut this part out. Uh, <laughs> no, we're, no, we're running. No, we're running it. We're running it. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Yeah, look, I mean, like, I think this is just like you. You do see this. I mean, this is like kind of a consistent behavior of just like you have gains in like one sector, you have money that rotates, and it just like sort of is this like wrecking ball that like moves around like crypto in like all different pieces. Like, I, I think like as like certain assets just get to a certain size and they're like a little more immune to it, but like you do still like see it, right? Like there'll be big moves into like one corner of the ecosystem it'll get hot plateau and then sort of move into the next one um and a lot of what we're doing is like looking at like where those flows are going like we don't try to predict them more as we like to see them like happen and then like we jump in so like we we are part of the problem <laughs> it, i mean i guess like where would where would be the next ball of, like where would i guess what's the next sector you look at where from where we are today just gotta watch it and, uh, literally, gotta watch. <laughs> the higher implied volatility in the market goes the more we have to think about it in this way, right? Where we literally have to consider like how unsustainable, you know, the prices of an asset, right? And how, how nimble we have to be, right? So um, obviously when Solana's at eight bucks, it's a different ball game, right? You can hold that out, right? For like a very long time. But when it's trading like a hundred to 140 within like a week and a half, like that's just a different game altogether. Awesome. Well, um, thanks for joining. It was a it was a lot of fun chatting with you guys, and we'll we'll have you guys on again. Uh, maybe we could do like a quarterly macro update on on state of things. It'll be fun. We'll until, do it until we're down only again. <laughs> Tweet. And, then, and then get us off <laughs> <guys>. <laughs> when we're all bearish. Let's <laughs> bearish circles. There's nothing to talk about. <laughs> no, there's plenty to talk about. Um, anyway. But nobody uh, wants to hear it. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> no one wants to go on Zapper or portfolio manager look at the portfolio, right? <laughs> Correct. Um, Great. Anyway, th- Fun thanks so much, guys. As always, the views expressed in the Good Game podcast are personal to the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of any other person or entity. Nothing here should be construed or relied upon as investment, legal, tax, or other advice. Thanks for listening to Good Game. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next week.